Well, hello everyone. Welcome to this uh, virtual meeting of the Royal Meteorological Society on uh, seasonal climate services uh, for the energy industry. So thank you very much for attending wherever you are around the world. I think we have people from quite a few different places. Um, so this is a, a virtual sort of taster session for a longer meeting we are planning to have next year in May next year. So if you like this, you'll be welcome to attend that one as well. Um, so um, I've just got a few sort of housekeeping slides to go through before I start. Um, so um, just a few things that might be of interest to people. First one is to do with the uh, Royal Meteorological Society weather magazine. And uh, Royal Meteorological Society are keen to, to make sure this uh, is focused well. And so they're asking university students um, if they would like to, and, and sort of early career people, if they would like to contribute to a sort of a one hour discussion, um, sort of one to one discussion about what they like about weather or if they actually read it at all. And uh, the good thing here is you get a £10 uh, Amazon voucher uh, for your time. So please uh, contact um, Hannah Mallinson uh, if you're interested in that. Um, we have the atmospheric science conference taking place uh, this year. It's slightly different because of the the, the, uh, the virtual setting. So instead, we have three sort of virtual events uh, on the 22nd of June, the 6th of July, and the 21st of September. So um, so details can be found uh, at um, at this website here, the atmospheric science conference uk website. Um, the Royal Meteorological Society has um, this uh, new Met Matters uh, newsletter. Um, so we're just advertising that. Uh, it's a monthly newsletter with lots of interesting blogs uh, and discussions about weather. So um, that might be something you're interested in. If you're not a member of the Royal Meteorological Society, please um, feel free to apply. Um, there are lots of different membership uh, benefits um, associated with that, including access to the weather magazine and uh, conferences and uh, and uh, being able to, to attend other meetings uh, for free when, when otherwise they would be paid for. Um, so uh, for this meeting here then, uh, well, I guess you're already logged in, but the recommended browsers are Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and Edge. So hopefully you have one of those. Um, to make the slides bigger, there are two things to do. You can remove the chat aspect, which is the little horizontal arrow with that line. So just push, basically push the chat to the right. And then the diagonal arrows basically enlarge the screen uh, a little bit as well. So that's a way to make it a little bit bigger. Um, please um, post questions to speakers uh, in the chat uh, at any time. And they'll be sort of selected. I'm not sure we'll be able to answer them all, but they'll be. Um, we'll go through those. And the idea is to go through in the question and answer session at the, at the end. So, but feel, feel free to to enter those at any time during during the talk talks. Uh, I guess that's what I've already I've already mentioned there. So that's that's all the sort of housekeeping slides. So. Um, I don't know, Sharon. Ah, great. So here's here's a little uh, sort of introduction to what we're um, hoping to talk about. I thought, although this is about very much about case studies and applications, I thought it would be useful to have a little introduction about how seasonal forecasts are made and and how they might be used and the importance of dialogue between the, the forecasters and the users, basically. So I'm just going to give a, a short introduction there. So seasonal climate services for the energy industry. Now, some of you will, of course, be well familiar with how forecasts are made. Um, but let's just, uh, this is a schematic diagram. I guess the key thing here is the word ensemble, um, recognizing that there is uncertainty in the forecast. We need to make an ensemble of forecasts, lots of different forecasts to get the statistics of what might be happening in the future. Here, I've just got a four member ensemble, but typically there may be more like 50 members or something like that. So how do we make um, these uh, forecasts, seasonal forecasts? I guess the first thing we do is we need to know what the initial conditions are, what the state of the, the atmosphere and the ocean are at the moment. 
Uh, and to do this, we use this data assimilation technique. So this is the, the part on the, the far left here. Um, we have um, some pr previous forecasts. The blue, the blue curves there show previous forecasts running forward in time. The x-axis is, is, is time, lead time, if you like. And the y-axis might be, say, the temperature at a particular place or wind speed or something like that. Um, so it's just a very much of a schematic. So we have the sort of the forecast from a previous short um, forecast there in blue. And then we have some new observations. The, these are the orange dots. So these are new observations that have come in about of temperatures, winds, humidities, uh, aspects in the ocean, lots of different things, which we then combine in a sort of optimal way with those blue um, what we call first guess forecasts to produce um, some initial conditions for our new ensemble forecast. And the new one is then in red. So you can see how the red curves sort of follow more the sort of truth, which is in white. They're a little bit better than the, the blue ones do because of the new observations. And then we, we run those forward in time to look at how the circulation will Will change over time. Now the x-axis is not linear here. You can see it's sort of more like a logarithmic one. I've got a, a day, a week, a month, and a season here. And, and as we move out into to the longer lead times, then the aspects which become perhaps more, more important uh, for the forecast are the things which have uh, are the slow, slowly evolving processes. So for example, the ocean circulation and temperatures, um, the sea ice, um, extent and soil moisture conditions. Um, so these are the things I've sort of represented on the bottom sort of schematically. And gradually, as we go to longer lead times, we expect these to be perhaps more dominant in, in what, the, what the forecast anomaly looks like. In this particular case, then, um, uh, in the, at the seasonal end, at the, at the end, we've got sort of perhaps three out of the four forecast members predicting say temperatures greater than the climatological average, that dashed line. So, you know, you would start on a very simple basis, you would say three, you know, maybe there's a three quarter chance, a three quarter or well, 75% chance of temperatures above normal. Uh, I've just constructed it so that is actually what happened as you can see in the truth, but this is just a schematic here. Um, and one thing uh, you'll notice is that um, as we go to longer lead times, then I am uh, in this schematic, I'm showing that there's increasing um, spatial and temporal smoothing going on. And this reflects the idea that, you know, as we go to longer lead times, we're not going to be able to get the timing of particular weather events right at all. It's more about the statistics. So we need to look at sort of the, the timescales really of, the, of those slow processes. That's where the predictability is going to lie. And also at longer, uh, larger spatial scales as well. So we've got those two aspects um, in there as well. So one kind of pattern, particularly interesting for Europe, this sort of larger scale circulation or flow type is the North Atlantic Oscillation, uh, NAO. So that little insert in the left panel shows a sort of um, what the North Atlantic Oscillation looks like in its positive phase. And you can see stronger winds coming um, off the Atlantic into Europe there. And the, the North Atlantic Oscillation really is, is a key um, indicator of the strength of those westerly winds and the latitude of those winds. Now, if we look at the how well we predict that circulation type um, uh, as a function of lead time, if we look at the daily time scale, that's what that left-hand panel is showing. You see that as we go from day five in the forecast down here to day 15, this skill is dropping off. This is the anomaly correlation uh, of the time series. And you can see it's dropping off reasonably quickly um, from quite good skill very early on. The North Atlantic Oscillation, that which is um, in blue and green there, is perhaps better predictable or more predictable than other regimes, something like blocking, which is something we've got at the moment. We've got a very long blocking at the moment in. Uh, in, uh, in April over Europe. Um, but in general, the North Atlantic Oscillation is more predictable than that, but still the skill is dropping off pretty quickly. But I also mentioned the idea of the space, the, 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 the time smoothing, the, the temporal smoothing. And when we look 
rather than just looking at the individual days, we look at what the anomaly is over the season, then you can see that red square indicates the correlation for predicting the NAO index um, over a season as a whole. This is when we use also a multi-model approach here. And the, the, uh, the references for that are at the bottom there. Um, so you see that um, we can, on the face of it, get, get skill if we're looking at the longer, um, the longer temporal scales and the, the larger spatial scales here. Of course, correlation is not the only thing we're interested in, but that gives some idea about where we may be gleaning some, um, some useful information. And of course, we can then look at how the North Atlantic Oscillation impacts things that users may be particularly interested in. So that right panel then shows the correlation between the North Atlantic Oscillation, the strength of that, and um, seasonal rain, winter rainfall over Europe. And you can see that uh, when it's in its positive phase, when we've got stronger winds over Northern Europe, we're getting a lot more precipitation over the United Kingdom, uh, Norway, and Northern Europe, and, and less over Southern Europe. So um, they're the kind of um, links that we might, um, might see there. Now, um, I guess, you know, users can, can use that, those forecasts and, and make decisions, but it's very much useful to have a two-way dialogue um, between the users and the forecast providers. And this is just a very simple um, life science um, uh, 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 life science session that we had at the Royal Meteorological Society a year or so ago. And, and the idea here was to look at um, how users actually make decisions based on forecasts. And of course, the, um, the, more, um, the more sophisticated users will be using the probabilities. And so here we were just asking what the probability, uh, what probability people would leave a campsite, you know, with the, with the chance of um, sort of dangerous gales um, the following day. And you can see on the left hand side that a lot of people would leave the campsite, leave their holiday, you know, at a probability of around about 0.3 or so. So less, less than a 50-50 chance that the gales were going to happen, they would leave the campsite because of the dangerous consequences that follow. But it's really useful for forecasters to know this distribution of these threshold probabilities, because it means that we can start to construct scores of our forecast system, which reflect the value of our forecast to users. And that's what we sh I'm showing on the right hand side there. So we've got the usual Briar score and the trends in that over the, um, the course of the last uh, uh, couple of decades. Um, so a smaller Briar score is better. So you can see things are getting better. But you can see that if we construct a user Briar score, which takes account of this distribution of pr um, probabilities, we get a slightly different um, picture. Um, and this. Um, is, is important because this is a is also a proper score of our forecast system. And proper scores are the sort of gold standard of assessing forecast systems. So it means that we can actually start to tailor our development, our sort of research and um, computing resources on areas which really matter to users. So this two-way dialogue is going to be particularly important um, uh, for, for developing the, the, the whole application sector, I guess. So this meeting is really about um, developing decision strategies based on, on forecasts and also this idea of promoting this two-way dialogue. So hopefully that's given a little bit of a background as to what um, uh, uh, how seasonal forecasts are made and the kind of things that we're interested in. Um, so we've got two, two um, speakers lined up today to, to, to talk. Um, and they're going to be talking much more about the sort of application side. So we have Professor Alberto Trocoli talking first. So he's uh, spent a, a lot of time looking at applications, particularly for the energy sector, um, looking at particular case studies and, and developing decision strategies, and has, uh, has run a European um, uh, project, um, European funded project, um, on this aspect. And then we have Dr. Daniel Drew, who's now at the National Grid, so sort of the electric uh, um, um, side of things. Uh, and although his talk's obviously a lot more wide ranging than I'm putting here, um, just the idea of sort of, you know, using 
um, seasonal climate forecasts uh, as part of the um, assessment of the winter peak demand for electricity. So we're going to have those two talks and then finally after that there will be a question and answer session. So that's the way it's going to be. So first of all I'd like to um, introduce Professor Alberto Trocoli to talk about uh, the climate service case studies and his outlook for the future. Hello Alberto. Um, I, I, I can hear you now. And uh, hi everybody. So um, it's a pleasure to be presenting at this uh, uh, little webinar. The uh, some of the results that we've achieved with uh, a project, uh, particularly uh, one uh, that I've led, the Circle Firm. I'll tell you more in a minute. But we'll also look a bit at lessons learned and with uh, some of the climate services uh, uh, where we are at, at this stage, uh, particularly in the European uh, arena. So I'm going to um, just to emphasize the fact that the, all these climate services uh, uh, projects uh, have uh, one common element, and that's uh, the co-design. Uh, I think we've uh, realized and uh, people now are on board on uh, the co-design aspect of, uh, of the climate services, which means that uh, uh, it's not a one-way conversation where we uh, scientists uh, prepare something and then we'll send it to the users and say, is that good enough or not? And then uh, hopefully it's, enough, it's good, but we don't really understand what's behind. Here, instead, we are talking around the table um, or uh, a board, as we used to do, and, and trying to come up with some uh, um, solution that is um, acceptable and, uh, and it's... Uh, uh, also satisfactory for both sides. Right, uh, underneath uh, all this, uh, the, um, on, uh, the, uh, on the background there is uh, Lyra, um, on the background of all the stories of this climate services, essentially it's a fictitious character, Lyra, uh, and, uh, but uh, she, uh, she actually cannot sleep at night, I don't know whether it was because of the, uh, the gale force winds that Mark talked about, and I don't know whether she's uh, sleeping in a campsite, but uh, uh, one of the problems that she faced was this uh, heat wave in um, 2015, uh, particularly southern Europe, and you can see here at the top uh, the um, temperature record, which was pretty high uh, historically, and, and the map also on the, uh, the bottom, but that, that, uh, the implication of this, uh, particularly in this case for Lyra, was that uh, the electricity price spiked uh, quite a bit from uh, an average of, uh, say, 50 euro per megawatt hour up to nearly 70, so a big jump, and, um, and that's, uh, well, if you multiply by the amount of megawatt, megawatt, megawatt hour that are um, dealt with by Lyra, then this is uh, a lot of money. That's why I'm afraid uh, she was a bit anxious with this event. So this is what uh, actually started the uh, uh, the project, alongside also some of the uh, data that uh, some. The, kind of assessment that we were making at the time about uh, seasonal forecast where we could see that uh, uh, here we are showing some of the uh, assessments for three systems at the time uh, so they're not uh, in use most of them are no, they, none of them are in use anymore but at the time we had uh, uh, these three systems uh, ECMWF, Meteor France and Meet Office and we looked at uh, variables that are beyond the traditional temperature and precipitation and, and, and found that uh, there are some levels of skill here in the red um, for other variables like wind speed, irradiance, relative humidity which are relevant for uh, the energy sector particularly but also other sectors. Here we focus on energy uh, at this uh, moment. So, so based on uh, on on uh, the problem that Lyra was facing and the um, uh, hope that there is a bit of skill here and there in uh, particularly in Europe, which is a difficult area for seasonal forecast, we uh, then started to put together a proposal for um, 
this project Secret Firm, which uh, now is towards uh, its end of life, uh, having started in February 2018 and uh, running for almost uh, four years in total, uh, we got five months left. So we have uh, a huge amount of uh, results and, um, and, and I'm, I'm a little embarrassed because I won't be able to show uh, a lot of them there's not going to be enough time, but uh, I'll encourage you to get in touch if you'd like to know more after what you see today. Um, the project has been uh, funded by the EU and participated by 10 partners, and so I was very uh, fortunate to lead this uh, project with all this uh, very capable and world-leading partners uh, who uh, uh, were very active during the project and uh, it was a bit difficult to keep up with all the output that was coming out. So, as I said, I'll give you a bit of uh, a flavor of what uh, what we've achieved, but there is uh, so much more. And so some of you will be disappointed because I won't be able to discuss uh, all the exciting science and the application and so on that uh, have uh, come out of the, of the project. Just to give you um, an idea of how the project was organized, because this is important in terms of um, learning the interactions within the, the project. Uh, we had um, different uh, capabilities uh, from uh, science, climate science, but also economists and uh, people from the industry. So uh, a diverse range and, and communications, of course, and, and uh, a bit of social science, so which is uh, economy anyway. So the um, the, the structure here is centered around uh, the first work package, which is um, where we set up uh, the case studies, which I'll mention in a minute. So we wanted to have this project around uh, practical applications of these case studies, but also uh, we wanted to find a way to uh, assess in uh, economic terms mainly how the uh, uh, addition of seasonal forecast to current practice would uh, lead to a difference in economic uh, gain or otherwise. Um, then there's um, work package two, which is uh, the um, uh, where all the most of the science has been happening, and we covered a lot of uh, approaches in, uh, in the related to seasonal climate forecast. And then work package three is the application. So taking what uh, is being set up in work package one, some of the science from work package two, and apply it to the case studies. And then with work package four, we uh, wrap everything up, all the results, and we present them as uh, proof of concept uh, climate services that are uh, the delivery mechanism for what uh, we've achieved. And then work package five, communication, dissemination and exploitation and that exploitation is actually a, something that has become an, a very important a very important component of European projects uh, so that's uh, something we also spend quite a bit of time on. Moving on uh, I mentioned the case studies we've got nine case studies we, and uh, two of them are actually uh, split into two so uh, we actually have uh, 11 case studies but we call them nine for simplicity because that's how they were set up at the beginning. And, um, and we cover the geographies mainly around Europe. Uh, we also have Colombia in South America though. And um, we have here, you can see all the partners that have contributed to each one of them. And one interesting thing is that uh, we, uh, we have some uh, industrial partners within uh, the project, but we also have uh, people, uh, companies who have contributed to the case studies who were not official partner, but nonetheless, they've, uh, they were very engaged and uh, contributed very closely to the development of the climate services. So we, again, we're very lucky to have such uh, motivated people to work with. And, uh, which uh, they allowed us to reach some uh, exciting results. So going now back to the approach we've taken, uh, we, um, we've started with uh, some uh, of the basics of how we can assess the economic uh, value of uh, adding seasonal forecast to a decision. And uh, as I said, each, each case study has its own decision. And so we looked at different methodologies for assessing. And here is a list, uh, it's a menu of economic assessment methods. And uh, for each of them, we, or each case study, we've assessed how we could use uh, the, uh, um, the, the, the methods. Um, 
think uh, there is a spurious uh, appearance, but uh, don't worry about that. Um, they will continue. One key element that we introduced here is not a new element at all. It's something that is quite standard, but um, we introduced uh, in the conversation the uh, decision tree. And one of the things that we've done is that uh, we set up uh, and, and constructed the decision tree for each case study. So most of them have, a, have most of the case studies have a well-developed uh, decision tree. And these um, decision trees have allowed us to really understand how the climate information comes in into the decision making. So I won't go into the details of this one. Uh, they, they are available online actually on our website. But uh, the point here is that uh, we found this as a very useful to, tool to um, bring together the two communities from the climate science and, and uh, industry and have a common uh, uh, aside from other, we use other techniques, but this has been uh, one uh, element that has uh, really helped in the communication, understanding, you know, what uh, someone means by, um, you know, using seasonal forecast in 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 the chain of uh, of what is done in an industry uh, context. So this is um, uh, really really helpful and something that uh, I think the project has um, uh, managed to. Um, use uh, very effectively. Okay, so now we move to some of the science results. Um, in, in the science we covered, in the research uh, of science, we covered many aspects around seasonal forecast. One of the dominant factor, let's say, is around multimodal. We stress the importance of using multimodal. Not, uh, not all the um, research has been done with multimodal, but uh, where we could, we've done it. And uh, we've come up with some very interesting results with multimodal. I mean, nothing uh, uh, that is not, uh, was not uh, uh, known before, but we established uh, better what, uh, how to go about uh, uh, choosing the, 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 mount, the models that are uh, producing the best combination. And we found, for example, that uh, using all models uh, is normally leading to a worse result than using the best models. And the best models are normally three or four out of um, 12 or 13 that we used. So it's important to limit the number of models. Obviously, they vary depending on the region and the variable and so on. Um, but alongside this, we introduced with the project uh, another element for the choice of multimodal, which is called uh, independence metric. On the right here, it's, um, it's not very clear how to interpret this, but you can see a number of models on the, on, on the uh, y-axis uh, and uh, x-axis. So they are comparing each other and looking at uh, how the various combinations uh, uh, increase value when they put together or otherwise. So you can then select um, a priori, you know, which models, I mean, you still need to run some statistics, but this helps with the, with the selection. Um, we also did uh, some combinations of um, statistical models with dynamical models and different statistical models also, like linear models and random forest model, non-linear models. So just looking at how, when we combine them all together, the um, uh, which of the input is the most uh, dominant. And this graph shows that um, uh, depending on the color here, we have zero, one, two, three. Um, the zero is where the dynamical models are uh, dominant, for example. So just one of the best dynamical models will beat the statistical models. But in other areas, you need to put um, combine uh, also the statistical model with the dynamical model to get better results. And um, the other aspect here is that we had to actually choose different um, reference data sets because um, there, there is actually quite a bit of difference if you take a reanalysis or, or an observation data set, even for temperature. So um, we decided to take an average in the end of four or five products uh, for the reference, and that uh, um, uh, gives uh, different results depending on what you choose. So that's also another area to uh, further explore. Um, we then also introduced another approach here. Uh, this is a kind of new approach, but very, very simple. And um, the idea here is that um, 
uh, and this is a theme that comes up uh, often when you speak with the industry, is that uh, you can uh, develop all sorts of uh, sophisticated methodologies, but in the end, um, in the industry, they just like to use a very simple approach because uh, at the moment, at least most people would just look at the, the mean, even if you have a, a probabilistic uh, forecast, uh, you can have 50 members, 100 members, 200 members, they just like one number. So normally that's the mean. And, and as most people know, the mean um, also is not, uh, yeah, it, it, it gives uh, good results, but often it also um, weakens the signals uh, both uh, on both sides, are high and low. Um, and so it's just a, a kind of definition of mean, I guess. Uh, so what we've done is to try to come up with a way that um, is a bit heuristic and, and says if we, um, if we see that the forecast is confident, um, then uh, we'll trust it. And, and so we set up the system in such a way that if we get um, uh, a number of assembled members above a certain threshold, then uh, we only keep those members to compute uh, the median or the mean. And that, that would then shift the, the forecast towards, um, towards uh, the, the signal. Of course, the signal could be wrong, and so you could make a bigger error. But uh, from the tests we've done, it's uh, more often you get uh, the, the right uh, sign. Uh, so the, the signal is amplified in the right direction. So, so this is um, just a simple thing that we've done and uh, seemed to be working well for uh, the several case studies that, that were led by um, our industrial partner NL. So um, I won't go into more detail, but there's so much more in terms of research we've done. We looked at weather types, we looked at downscaling, we, uh, different methodologies for downscaling, different methodologies for weather types. So we looked at the extremes, uh, and um, so there, there it's, uh, um, yeah, it would take us hours to just go through all the results. And uh, now our task is to uh, try to write up all this uh, uh, exciting results and uh, yeah th 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 this other one I just mentioned the uh, the downscaling method um, using uh, Adamont from Meteor France and which gives uh, pretty good results uh, if we take uh, for example two degree grid here and we go to 0 0.25 uh, uh, using the Adamont here you get um, and then the weather regimes I mentioned so I'll go quickly then we apply, so we are moving now to work package three. So the applications, I've just touched on two examples here. Uh, this one is from uh, NL, the, uh, that's where you see, uh, you remember this picture from Lyra. Um, and uh, I think she's still awake and trying to resolve a, a problem here. And then it turns out that, um, I will, again, I won't go into all this detail. So there's a lot of colors and a lot of graphs. Um, I'll just tell you the um, bottom line here basically is that uh, we actually found a little bit of um, skill. We just looked at one case, uh, one season, so it's all uh, something to take with a pinch of salt. But uh, um, the uh, good news is that uh, there is some signal coming from seasonal forecast, even for Italy in this case, for the heat wave uh, with one or two months uh, um, bleed time. So um, we know the skill normally is pretty low, but in this case, the signal um, was so strong that uh, the model could pick it up. And that led to some uh, useful um, economic value in retrospect uh, for, for NL. So we set up the system and looked at uh, all these old case studies in the past to see you know, what uh, if we knew what was the forecast, what would have changed in terms of economics. And we run, and then has run all this economic assessments, uh, very sophisticated uh, evaluations uh, with the trading and so on, and come up with uh, all the results. Again, uh, this is uh, the very tip of the iceberg that I'm showing. And um, another case study, this is a case study nine, where we uh, looked at the water demand with uh, Thames Water as uh, an external stakeholder, but um, uh, very active and uh, provided uh, a lot of feedback on the, um, on the science and as, as well and the way we uh, present uh, the climate services um, that were prepared by the Met Office. And uh, here in this case, the, the weather types were used and uh, then uh, you set some threshold for when um, you think it's a critical um, uh, point where you, you want to know 
whether there's going to be more or less water and so on. So we choose weather patterns that, uh, that are related to that, that we do a bit of downscaling and then uh, compute the pr uh, probability of exceedance. As I said, I'm going very quickly. This um, Then we move, uh, we're now here in the realm of uh, the trial climate services. So how we deliver, it, deliver all this uh, uh, work that we've done. And this is uh, one simple example where we have a visual tool on the left uh, called Teal. I'll show you a little bit more. And this provides some data that then uh, uh, will be fed into the uh, modeling and uh, link functions of uh, use by NL uh, and then they come up with the decision making here and the hedging strategy. All sophisticated uh, approaches. And, and another example here, just uh, uh, two, I just showed two. Uh, again, this is related to the uh, other case study I showed you, the Thames Water 1 case study 9. And um, here that you can see the, um, the progression also of uh, how the, uh, uh, the, the, the trial climate service has been put together. In this case, there's no uh, kind of a, a platform as such. Uh, the, the service is delivered uh, through plots and uh, commentary and conversations. So that, that was the preferred uh, method of uh, delivery. And um, you can see here how the, uh, uh, the, 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 the graphs are simplified more and more to come to on like three, uh, number three here, uh, just a line which tells you uh, the colors, red and green, so traffic light type of system where you know when the critical days are happening. And then with four, uh, there's also comparison uh, with uh, for different, three different thresholds, critical thresholds, and how the forecast, which is the, the curve here, compares to the uh, climatology, which is the um, smooth line that you see following there. So um, this, this has been found uh, useful by Thames Water, and they've applied, this was for uh, an old case, but they, um, the, for the Beast of the East, uh, basically um, as, as a base, as cases, but uh, there was also a case earlier in 2020 when they are they were able to replicate some of uh, of the of this uh, work as well and see how it works in practice. So what uh, what we tried to do uh, we looked at uh, the idea was that we worked through past case studies, but with the idea that this uh, climate services would become uh, operational eventually. And also the other thing that we have explored in the project is different methodologies of, uh, of, of delivery. So we have a, a, a wide range of uh, options uh, running from the uh, visual tool, online tool to this methodology here and, and other various forms that uh, won't be able to discuss here. You can find much more about the case studies on the flyers that are available on our website, the, the project website. And uh, communication also has been, uh, uh, is an important component. It continues to be uh, through social media, but also other uh, activities. Uh, we have a stakeholder workshop on the 25th of May, so everybody's invited. Uh, we are preparing the invitations, uh, all the material. Uh, we have um, other blogs and testimonials and uh, newsletter coming out, uh, updating the case study fly flyers, the scientific papers I mentioned, and the summer school we are going to organize for September. And, and also in terms of exploitation, we run uh, regular assessments about uh, uh, intended user groups, uh, potential benefit, co-owners and patterns of, um, of the climate services, exploitation route envisaged, intellectual property consideration and business development opportunities. So there's uh, uh, quite a lot going on here through the chain of climate services. So just to sum up on uh, Cycle Firm, uh, what I believe are the key achievements are um, mainly four. So we refine the approach to effectively assess climate information for decision making. Uh, decision trees have been a critical element, as I mentioned considerably advanced the research into the use of seasonal forecast. Uh, 
the focus has been on multimodal, but also statistical models, downscaling, weather types, uh, etc. Um, so a lot of uh, a lot of exciting science coming out of uh, the project. Demonstrated uh, the third one is demonstration of the value of seasonal forecast. Uh, which has come about mainly by showing that if we tailor the forecast, we get um, uh, a better uh, outcome for the case studies. And um, I should also add that uh, uh, even if uh, the uh, value is not in terms of economic terms, we found that there is a, um, another more important value, which is the uh, embedment of, uh, if that's a word, of the forecast into uh, long-term strategies of the company. So they, um, they've now become aware that this uh, forecast are producing what they are producing. They have limitations, but uh, this is something they want to continue using uh, in the longer term. And that's, that's one of the key uh, achievement, I guess. So not just our project, but uh, in our project, we uh, clearly demonstrated that we're demonstrating that. And the uh, development of dry climate services also uh, has been done in a co-co-co uh, approach, which is uh, uh, co-design, co-development, co-production. So I think we've uh, demonstrated that uh, we really put into practice what uh, was uh, this uh, kind of uh, vague concept of uh, uh, doing things together with uh, users or stakeholders or however we want to call people who use the forecast eventually. Um, so even industrial users, not uh, former project partners, have uh, been closely engaged, as I mentioned, like uh, Thames Water or Shell or um, um, other, other partners with Tenet and so on. Now, just quickly um, uh, to mention some other activities, because the Copernicus Climate Change Service, uh, most of you will be aware, but this is a very important uh, component in the ecosystem of climate services, because it provides a bedrock um, for uh, the data that are used by most of the climate services that are of the other projects that are running in Europe, but also elsewhere because they, they, they provide global data in many cases. Um, in this case, uh, there is uh, also a component for energy, which I happen to uh, lead. And um, it's uh, uh, one where we have three elements. So we have uh, the past, uh, so the historical records, uh, through the analysis year five, uh, uh, we have the seasonal forecast uh, operationally uh, from three models, and um, and we also have climate projections, and we do uh, indicators for climate variables as well, of course, for energy. Otherwise, uh, wouldn't be called energy service. And we have electricity demand, wind power production, photovoltaic production, and hydro power production. So. Very quickly, uh, again, I'll invite you to look at um, uh, uh, the C3S website for more information or get in touch with me. Now, um, to sum up, I don't know how much time I have. I've probably over time, uh, there was, uh, sorry, uh, and I, I just uh, touched the, the surface, scratched the surface. So, um, I, but I just want to give some reflections on, uh, on, on climate services, where we are now. Um, about eight, ten years into the funding from the EU, the investment that the EU has been making, particularly other continents as well, but uh, Europe, uh, I must say, is um, leading in this uh, area. And um, uh, there's no bias there, I guess. Uh, so the investments that have come through H2020, Copernicus, year 4 cs and other national supports, there's a lot of national projects as well, uh, I, I think has resulted in uh, Europe being world leader in climate service development. And we started with, uh, with this kind of busy picture uh, about uh, there was uh, the planning and, and so on that I always found a bit uh, confusing, I must say. Um, uh, but uh, I think it helped in uh, structuring how the climate service um, investment was going to move forward. Uh, this was probably uh, seven, eight years ago, I can't remember. Um, but as we moved forward, I think the picture has become pretty clear. Um, at least this is how I see it. And, and uh, as I said, we got uh, C3S here in terms of climate services 
um, delivering the uh, essential data that is used by different uh, climate service projects uses uh, a lot of uh, a huge amount of people and and this is really critical because it's an operational service it's going to run uh, for a long time uh, there's commitment from Europe and so that's that's um, uh, it's going to be um, something that uh, will uh, generate a lot of um, uh, use and business and so on However, the data that is provided by C3S, um, however important, it is a bit uh, technical for people who are not familiar with climate data. And that's why we need all these uh, projects here, the uh, Horizon 2020 and the Year 4CS. And I put here some of the logos of some of the projects we were more closely aligned with, uh, like Clara, S2, S4E, Medgold, and now Focus Africa. Uh, where we participate also. And, and uh, all these projects, uh, most of these projects use the C3S data, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done from those data to go to the users. So um, that's, again, wh where the, uh, all these projects come in, and, and this has helped to bring uh, the, the data closer to the users, closer to the uh, uh, actual commercialization of the climate services, but we are not there yet. Um, as I'll show you, because uh, uh, so the forecast, um, the forecast quality is forecast quality is improving, but uh, it's not uh, uh, still uh, sufficient for many uh, users, and and it's partly to do with expectations because um, uh, if you think about other sectors here, for example, this is a case in Australia where last year. There was a uh, dire predictions that the housing market would fall by 30%. This was in April 2020. And, uh, and basically what happened is that uh, um, this hasn't really verified. And on, in, in uh, early this year, instead, uh, Australian property market to rise to record highs this year. So this is 2021, having predicted this 30% drop last year. And now it went the other direction. So. Um, we, we're actually probably in a more fortunate uh, situation with, uh, with climate science where we have, uh, we do have errors maybe um, of this sort, but probably not uh, as often. So if people, you know, read and uh, have all these headlines all the time from predictions of all sorts in economy and so on, why, why can't we, uh, you know, allow for some uh, uncertainty in our in our predictions and 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 allow and and um, for users to be able to deal with this uh, uncertainty, knowing that that's not always they they are right, but uh, uh, you know they can get some value out of them. And this is what again what uh, we also demonstrated doing Secular Fair. Um, but this also requires close engagement, and again that's the importance of the investment from the EU because that has allowed to have all these conversations. Uh, um, workshops, they call the workshops when we could have them in person, but uh, we can also, not as effectively, but we can run them also online now, and uh, we are achieving uh, also some good interactions through online um, engagement, so that's um, something that we can continue. And, and then uh, um, the, there is also that, uh, the fact that uh, the exact way in which the climate service is delivered is not critical. So that's what uh, many people talk about, uh, visualization and so on, the, uh, what is good and not. And there's a lot of discussion about that. I, I do think that uh, you know, a good visualization tool helps uh, the communication. But uh, we found that the insect firm is not essential. Um, but uh, uh, personally, I, I, I regard the um, visualization something that uh, needs to be uh, expanded and, and, and continued uh, because we, we found that uh, particularly if, uh, if uh, you know, the, you, you spend quite a bit of effort on the user experience, the UX, um, and, and so that, that uh, requires, but again, quite a lot of engagement with users, but eventually you get some good results. And we, we like in this case, with, uh, on the right here with the TIL tool that we developed at uh, WMC, we're getting some very good feedback on uh, uh, the usage of tools like this, also for uh, less specialized users. 
The last uh, slide, I think, is this. Um, so what, what's, what's next for climate services in, uh, in my view? So I think that, that we have, uh, uh, I, I think I depicted this idea that, that we've uh, uh, moved uh, uh, forward. Uh, the sector is increasing, is stronger, uh, thanks to all the uh, investments from the EU, uh, but we're not there yet. But, uh, but looking ahead, I think uh, that we still um, need uh, uh, probably about five or 10 years to get to the level of uh, where the weather services are. But the good news, uh, if you look at the investments in weather services, uh, probably you can't read it well, the stable, but I can uh, I just point to a couple of figures here. Um, and, and this is uh, investments from uh, private investors, so, um, you know, people who put huge amount of money into companies to make them grow. And there are a couple of companies here that have attracted more than 300 million, two of them together. Most of them are, uh, of these companies are around um, weather services, but they also start to do some climate services. So there's one Pacific company uh, who, uh, which received uh, some investments uh, just last month of 245 millions uh, to do with the satellite data an analytics and solutions. And another one, 77 million for weather forecasting platform. This is in the US where um, I think it's uh, investments of this sort is more understood. But uh, um, I think with all the investment that we, uh, the US done in Europe and a, a lot of uh, companies that are popping up uh, on climate services will, uh, will reach some, uh, not as high as this, but some good figures in the next five, 10 years so in Europe as well. That's my, that's my view. Um, and to conclude, I think uh, with Secular Firm, we, uh, we put uh, some uh, um, kind of confidence in uh, the, the, the forecast to our users. So obviously, as I said, uh, we still have a, quite a way to go to improve the forecast. But at least uh, Lyra was satisfied enough that uh, she could uh, go to bed and, and rest. Maybe she was so tired that she couldn't stay awake anymore. That's, uh, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Great to see uh, um, such a good start um, with the communication between the, the forecasters and the, and the users. Um, so um, please feel free, everyone, to ask questions in the chat. Um, we'll address those uh, at the end. Um, uh, but now we're going to move on to Daniel Drew, who uh, is now working at the National Grid. And as I said, he's particularly going to be focusing on looking at peak demand, uh, winter peak demand uh, based on seasonal climate forecasting. So, uh, can you hear me, Daniel? Are you there? Thank you very much. Okay, over to you. And hi, everyone. Uh, I just want to go through a couple of things today. Firstly, what we do as a company, what we forecast, and then finish by just giving a couple of examples of some of our forecasts at this sort of seasonal timescale. So I work for National Grid ESO, which stands for Electricity System Operator. Uh, we don't generate electricity. We just move it from where it is to where it is needed, balancing the supply and demand second by second. So I will zoom in on this diagram on the right in a minute, but I'll just go through it briefly. The generators generate electricity. It's then fed in to the transmission network, which is high voltage. Where it's moved around the country and then sent to distributed distribution network, which is at lower voltage, and then sent to the end user. And it's our, our bit is this bit in the middle, the electricity system operator works on this transmission network. So we're managing the flows of electricity around the country. And this is getting more and more complicated for a variety of reasons. So in terms of the generators, we're getting more and more weather dependent generation. So onshore and offshore wind farms and solar panels. Uh, we're also more interconnected. So at the moment we have interconnections with France, Belgium, Netherlands, Ireland, and we'll soon be connected to Norway. At the other end of the system, in the distributed network, 
we have uh, an increase in the number of small generators, such as people putting solar panels on their roof. And we don't actually see this as generation. We just see this as a suppression in the demand because it goes straight into the distribution network. So it's just less generation needs to be provided on the transmission network because it's being met by small scale generators. And of course, there's more uh, demand side response. So people shifting when they use electricity to avoid peak periods. So what do we forecast? We forecast all renewable generation, so wind and solar panel uh, power, and also the national demand. And national demand is the amount of generation supplied by the transmission network to meet the demand within Great Britain. So to put it a little bit more simply, it's the sum of generation minus the power used by the generators themselves minus any interconnector exports. And of course, as I was mentioning before, this demand number is suppressed by any embedded generation. So we have six gigawatts of wind, 13 gigawatts of solar panels, all suppressing that demand. So any forecast we make of national demand needs to include a forecast of the embedded generation. So just to give you some idea of the drivers of the demand variability, obviously weather, which we'll focus on today, um, but also there's time of year, time of day, bank holidays, and I'm sure you've heard about TV pickups. Uh, but the new one is COVID restrictions. So as for different stages of lockdown, as different parts of the industry are open and closed, there's obviously some kind of suppression in the demand, which we need to be able to forecast. So this is the new challenge. So we forecast for a variety of reasons. Firstly, to ensure that there's enough electricity on the system to meet the demand, so it's all balanced. We also need to forecast so we can get the amount of reserve right so we can ensure that if there's a problem on the system or if there's a loss, we can still operate the system securely. We also need to forecast the flows around the country to make sure the electricity to get, can get from where it's generated to where it's needed without breaking any of the constraints. And we need to plan ahead to make sure we do this in the most economic way possible. So make sure we run the system reliably and securely and economically. Uh, we publish all of our forecasts to the market via our data portal or the Alexon website, and then the market can take position based on our forecasts. So there's a range of forecasts we produce, at a range of different lead times, because we have a range of different applications for the forecasts. So if we start on the right hand side of this figure, in day, day ahead, one to two week ahead, this is what I call sort of the real time management of the system. So making sure there's enough supply to meet demand, making sure we don't break any constraints on the system, making sure we can deal with any outages. And at this sort of lead time, we use a weather forecast. So zero to 14 days, we use weather forecast data. And then for all of our sort of planning applications, anything from two weeks ahead to 10 years ahead, we jump immediately to using a climatology. So it's really in this window around this dotted red line where I'm going to focus today. So can we use any information from seasonal forecasts to improve how we transit from our regular weather forecast to our climatology? And I'm going to do this with two examples. So the first one is our 13 week ahead forecast. So as I say, at this sort of lead time, we've been using climatological weather. So we derive a half hourly time series of weather using 25 years of observational data. We create what we call the normal weather, which is just the average over this time period. 
And if you look at the figure on the right here, the blue line is the demand that we calculated back in November based on this normal weather. You can see the weekly cycle and then the dip for Christmas as the demand decreases. And this is for DP, darkness peak, which is the peak demand time in the day, sort of five, six o'clock in the evening in winter. So we've been exploring new ways of doing this forecast. And one we've considered is running multiple scenarios where we use reanalysis products. Uh, we've used Mirror 2, but we could have used any other product available. So we have 40 years of weather data. We then run this through our demand model, run it through our wind and solar model so we can get the embedded wind and embedded solar. And the gray lines hit on this figure are the different demand forecasts. And the huge benefit of this approach is we get to see a range of the demands. So what it could be, the sort of range of possibility of what it could be rather than just a single value. And the ensemble median on here is the red line. And my work at the moment is really just trying to understand why it's so different from the normal weather. A crucial bit to point out at this stage is we need our demand forecast to be at a sub daily resolution, ideally every half hour, but at the very least we need the daily maximum to do all the planning that we undertake to make sure the system's secure. So that's the first product. The second one I want to talk about is this winter peak demand. Um, so every October, we publish a peak demand forecast for the upcoming winter. And the idea of this is to make sure that we've got sufficient capacity to meet that demand, to make sure the system's all ready and everything's in place to deal with whatever demand level we anticipate. So we use a method called the average coal spell method. I'm going to give a very brief overview of this approach today, but if you want more details, you can follow this link here. So it's based on our 30 years of historic weather, and we do some Monte Carlo sampling to construct 70,000 possible future winters from that 30 years of data. So we're taking out chunks of 10 to 14 days of weather and stitching them together with other years. We then run that through our demand model, our embedded wind and PV model, and end up with 70,000 winter demand forecasts, and we find the peak for each winter. And then depending on the application, we'll take the 50th percentile or maybe the 90th percentile, depending on what we're going to use that number for. So we then have a forecast of our winter peak demand. So we've been doing some work with the Met Office as part of the secular firm project, which Alberto described. Um, we've been looking at, can we incorporate some of the Met Office seasonal forecast information into our peak demand forecast? Now I should point out at the moment that this is all experimental work. It's all done offline and it, the operational systems running without any of this input. So to do a peak demand forecast, the biggest driver is the temperature, but we also need the wind speed for our embedded wind forecast. But fortunately, we don't need the radiation because our peak demand is more, it's going to be in the evening, seven, six o'clock when there's no PV. So the Met Office seasonal forecast have some skill in forecasting the seasonal mean of some variables but there isn't sufficient skill to forecast the within season variability. And as I was mentioning, we really need sub daily weather observations for our peak demand forecast. Uh, for temperature, we need forecast of the temperatures in the hours leading up to 1700. And for wind speed, we need the wind speed at the precise time of the peak demand. So we've been exploring ways where we can use the information available in the seasonal mean and apply it to our sub daily weather data. So 
the idea is to take the climatology which we've been sampling from. So that's the grey uh, data on this plot and shift it based on the seasonal means from the Met Office forecast. And so this on the left, we have the temperature and on the right, the wind speed. And this is for a single point in the day. This is 1700 on a particular day. The gray is our historical distribution. And then, so in November, 2020, we received a forecast from the Met Office, which had a NAO positive signal for DJF. We applied that seasonal mean forecast to our climatological data and you can see that it led to a shift upwards in the temperatures slightly, the red lines the median, and similar in the wind speed, which is consistent with this NAO positive signal. So then based on this new distribution, we can rerun our model and see what effect this would have on our peak demand forecast. So if we have a look at what we did publish in the winter outlook for 2021, we published this in September, October. So if you remember at that time, there was huge uncertainty about what the restrictions would be in the UK with regards to COVID-19. And so, and that would have huge uncertainty on our demand forecasts. So we run three scenarios, a low demand with uh, strict lockdown, lots of industry closed down, high demand with a looser lockdown, and then our best case. And if you look at the average cold spell peak for those three scenarios, you can see it ranges from 52, 56.2 gigawatts to 59.7. So a range of 3.5 gigawatts across our COVID scenarios. If we were to incorporate the Met Office seasonal forecast into this, it would move that, season, that peak demand by approximately 500 megawatts downwards because it's slightly warmer, windier, so it moves the demand downwards. Uh, but compared to our uncertainty with, COVID, with our COVID restrictions, this is a relatively small change. Um, the figure here just shows the real application of this data. We need to know, do we have enough capacity available to ensure there is a nice enough margin to meet our peak demand for the coming winter? So as I say, at the moment, this is all very much experimental work. Uh, we've identified a number of limitations. Um, firstly, that the, the data set produced is unordered. So there's no seasonal cycle within our DJF. The temperature and wind points are not synchronized. Uh, secondly, our demand forecast has lagged weather terms in. And so we need to be able to incorporate this into the forecasting method. So if you have a prolonged period of cold weather, you'll have a different demand to if you just had a single day of cold weather. And finally, um, Perhaps crucially, uh, we published this forecast in October. So we do most of the work in September. And that may be at a time where there is no or little skill in the seasonal forecast provided by the Met Office. But that needs to be explored. Uh, this is very much work we'd like to carry on with, but at the moment it's still an offline operation. Just to summarize, uh, we produce a lot of long range forecasts. I've just given you uh, two examples. Uh, for these, we use historical weather data for anything that's beyond 14 days ahead. We've been exploring whether we can start to incorporate the information of seasonal forecasts into our processes. It's very early days. If anybody has any comments or ideas, then please do get in touch because we'd definitely like to take this forward. And with that, I'll hand back to Mark. A uh, very nice uh, talk there, uh, your perspective and uh, how you're developing these um, these decision models. Yes, I understand it is sort of early days at the moment, but it's nice to see how you're going about that. Um, I think we'll uh, if we start now by um, 
sort of opening up this to uh, some questions. I can see some questions already in the chat, um, but uh, perhaps to generate some more interest, I thought maybe I would just ask a few sort of, um, perhaps to sort of raise some themes that might be of, uh, of interest to discuss. Um, so one, and I think someone mentioned this a little bit, um, the dialogue, uh, um, the co-design, you know, what are, is, is the dialogue at present good enough? Are there some limitations in the dialogue? Maybe, you know, the market competition means that people can't be really open about everything they're doing or, you know, how can we improve the dialogue, I guess, um, would be an interesting one to think about. Um, so Daniel mentioned some um, some constraints. I don't know if they're sort of like red lines. Do do constraints, which, you know, hard lines about, you know, delivering delivering whatever you're delivering do they do they sort of mean that the the utility of the forecast is 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 changed maybe the utility of the forecast is not so important if you really have to to stick to some some limits or, or base some limits um i guess another another thing that uh, daniel mentioned the sort of the, the fact that radiation perhaps isn't so useful because because the demand and the and the supply are at different at different times but maybe in the future with increasing um, energy storage and uh, increasing capacity um, maybe that changes the the effect of our forecasts uh, on the markets i don't know so there's some interesting things that maybe people would like to talk about um, uh, let's start um while while we um, hopefully that will bring in some more questions. Uh, let me just go through the questions we have uh, already then. Um, so actually, let's start with uh, Irasima here. Um, now, um, do I need to click on it? Has, has that appeared or has that disappeared? I don't know whether I've clicked the right thing there. Um, so Ir Irasima said, uh, hi, Albert, a nice talk. How are the interactions in the co-production process. I guess that's this, what, what um, Alberto meant as his sort of co-design. Um, so I don't know, Alberto, if you wanted to comment on on that, how, how those interactions go. Um, you can interpret the question probably as well as I can. So. Yeah, so they're, they're, they're obviously conversations done different depending on uh, context but um, generally speaking uh, there is uh, when you start a process like this there is always a phase where you know it takes a bit of time to come together and uh, speak the, a common language so that's uh, something that most uh, climate service projects have found uh, and and uh, it's really important to go beyond that barrier you know uh, the expectations from users and uh, understanding of how things are used in, uh, in the context of the decision. But um, once once you get over that barrier, I think at least what, um, also because the, the project was set up this way, we found that, uh, you know, we had conversations, all the, uh, the several meetings where users and scientists were in the same room and discussing how to use this and, and that. So once you identify the limitations of uh, you know people not wanting to have a hundred meter resolution uh, six months ahead or something like that. Then uh, uh, then you on the same page and you can work together and and resolve uh, some of the uh, questions or specific questions together. And that's what we've done uh, in the co-design, which means putting together the the case study, understanding where we're going, and then the the, the co-production, which is uh, or the co-development of the the, uh, the actual solutions, uh, looking at the specific uh, uh, science uh, response, and then uh, how it's applied in practice, and then the co-production, the last phase where we work together on the delivery. And that that is basically you know going back and forth and say you know what what about adding this feature here? What uh, it's it can it can be a bit tedious to explain, but uh, it's it's really you know working together more. It's not. It's more like uh, it's not like a client and, and producer kind of uh, um, a, a report. It's, it's 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 closer. It's a closer. There's a, a closer interaction because that's that's what's required at this stage. Once I think once we get to a stage where you know 
it's more understood what is required by users, then uh, you know things will flow more um, quickly. And and as I said, uh, there is also scope for increased market for this type of services. Yeah, I guess it's a it's a very sort of early days, and uh, I guess everyone has to get their head around uh, you know how how the forecast could affect their decision and. Um, and you know what can be provided in the seasonal forecast. I can imagine there's quite a lot that you need to sort of get quite close together at to to answer those questions. Um, on a sort of related topic, um, uh, Ian here. I don't know your other name, Ian, but um, said uh, hi, Daniel. Uh, we've started to use sub seasonal forecasting uh, into demand um, into demand prediction for water. Uh, there must be a link between water demand and electricity demand. I'd be happy to discuss that. Maybe you could discuss it a bit here. I mean, it's not just about co-design between forecasters and users. Maybe there is co-demand between different users, a, a co-design between different uh, users. Oh, absolutely. So the example I gave here is for the winter peak for us, but we're just as interested in summer. So when we have either hot, dry conditions, with high levels of solar during the day and very low demand or as we pick up more air conditioning. So yeah, we're interested in winter, summer, just like water companies will be. And it's just a question of forecasting supply and demand. It's just a different service. Very happy to discuss. Please drop me an email. I guess it, when you think of something like the uh... The North Atlantic Oscillation we, we spoke about, then of course there's there's a lot of um, correlation between the the winds and and the rain. Uh, you know, uh, uh, so that might mean mean that decisions in the two sectors are sort, sort of quite strongly linked. So maybe learning from each other's practices and how you glean the information from things like the North Atlantic Oscillation that could be useful. Absolutely, yes. So the at the moment, what's mainly keeping me awake is the cold, calm winters. But equally, the wet and windy are present different challenges, both linked to the NAO. Thank you. I mean, that's actually a, a question that I I wondered about was the the um, relative importance of of extremes versus more sort of you know general weather where where are the best decisions to be made it'd be interesting to know uh, if you think uh, you can get more information or you know get more utility out of the prediction of extreme events rather than just the sort of general trends in uh, in the temperatures and so on and something else that maybe to be considered um okay uh so, um, so uh, I don't know whether maybe you're familiar. I know um, Alberta, you're in Australia at the moment, so as you travel across the, the equator quite a bit. So, so Aaron is saying, um, is the similar climate energy demand applicable in tropical regions? I don't know if you can can uh, discuss that a little bit. Is that for me or for Daniel? I think it's demand is in terms of electricity demand. Well, I, I presume. I think it could. I think you could uh, discuss it. <laughs> Both of you could discuss it. I think. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if there is a scope for uh, expanding a bit on the question because. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean. I mean well, maybe Aaron. Aaron can. Uh, I mean, can uh, expand a bit, but if you wanted to start, Daniel, to start. I don't know whether you've been looking at all at the the tropics or whether are different uh, situations there, or maybe National Grid is very much linked to say the UK. I don't know. Yes, so very much linked to the UK at the moment. But I guess it's a question of just framing your que question. What are you trying to answer? What are the issues for your region? So for the UK, the issues are cold, calm winters or summers where you have high levels of renewables and low demand. And it's just finding the tools that can answer those questions. And then for the tropical region, it's what are your stress? What's the weather that's causing stress on your system? And then finding the tools that you can use to help answer those questions. 
Yeah, I guess. Uh, and I guess, uh, well, yeah, maybe, sorry. Yeah, just on that line, I think if it can help, uh, if if that's what the question meant, uh, you know, you can uh, have other examples. I mean, we work also with the tropical region. Uh, we working also with uh, Focus Africa now I mentioned um, and has a bit of tropics there. But um, yeah, even in Europe, you can find different uh, typology of usage of electricity, for example, you know, France being uh, driven by uh, nuclear it relies a lot of an electric uh, electricity. So they have uh, all the system is geared towards using electrical appliances and so on. Uh, rather than heating, you know, um, so even electrical uh, heating is uh, electrical rather than gas, uh, which is not the case in Italy, for example. But in Italy, you have uh, a lot of maybe more than other parts in terms of uh, air conditioning. So there you get huge peaks now since about 10 years ago. It didn't used to be, but uh, that has changed. You can see a sudden uh, increase in uh, in demand since 10 years ago when their conditioning started to become very popular. So all these things, you know, uh, need to be understood in the context of, like uh, Daniel said, you know, what are the stresses in the, in the system. Thank you. Um, we have a question um, from, um, from uh, let's go for the one from Hazel here. Um, so, Hazel says, hi, Dan, it was great to see your comparison of the impact of a seasonal forecast on demand versus a, a COVID impact. Hopefully in the future, COVID will have less of an impact in a more typical year, assuming COVID is gone. <laughs> what would be the magnitude of other industry impacts compared to the seasonal forecast? I guess she's sort of getting at, you know, what, um, what the seasonal forecast might um, might play in in a more typical year i guess yeah it's a very good question so ahead of the winter we've normally got a reasonably good idea of the variability in most of our demand parameters with the exception of the weather so the weather is the dominating factor in a typical year this year it's been completely dwarfed by covid restrictions uh, I haven't got the numbers to hand, but I could definitely continue this conversation with Hazel, but weather is the big impact for our seasonal forecasts. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Um, there is a question here that has been, uh, I'm sorry, she's slipping now from Antia. I didn't want to go to the, she was the first person to ask a question actually, but I. I wanted to keep to the seasonal side of things to start with. She was um, uh, just asking about um, whether we see a potential for a longer um, decadal prediction for energy users. I, I don't know whether, Alberta, you may be in a position to, to think about that a little bit. It certainly is uh, a need for decadal prediction, uh, but uh, it's it's when, uh, you know, we think or users think that uh, you know, like seasonal is already kind of borderline at this stage in terms of uh, of skill and 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 people starting to gain get getting used to uh, uh, use it somehow. Um, although seasonal forecast has been around have been around for 15, 20 years, and uh, skill hasn't improved uh, that much. I mean, a little bit, yes, but not uh, hugely in Europe. So um, how long is it going to take for the Cato forecast to go through the same process? I don't know, because, um, yeah, it's, uh, uh, as far as I know, yeah, we're not there yet. Um, obviously, some people are using some surrogate, taking climate projections, looking at the first uh, few years of the projections. In other cases, I've been involved also in... Uh, more extravagant approaches, just using uh, extrapolations uh, of uh, interpolated data. So, you know, there, 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 are, there are certainly is a need, but uh, um, I don't think there is a strong uh, uh, signal from, uh, signal as in uh, the voice coming out of uh, the community saying, okay, we're ready to go. So that's, that's basically what he requires. And then obviously you don't want to go out too soon, but 
but uh, some risks need to be taken as well. Okay, so yes, that sort of change over there from the seasonal to the longer time scales is uh, perhaps you have to work from the the uh, seasonal out. On a sort of slightly similar question for you, Daniel, um, at the other end, I guess it's that red line you had on your on your graph. Um, so. Uh, how do you deal with a forecast around the red line? So the sort of transition, I guess, fr from the for weather forecast to the climatology. Yeah, so we blend as we move from the weather forecast data into the climatology. A relatively simple blend. Again, open to ideas of how we can improve that. We just didn't want a firm cutoff of 14 days you use your forecast and then you use the climatological weather so we start to combine the two at, around that red line okay and do you see a sort of change in utility at that point do you see some kind of sharp jump somewhere or you sort of is that blending approach able to sort of smooth things out so the idea uh, at the moment i think it's it's doing okay but the forecast product we buy already has some blending out to the 14 days. So okay. different models are used yeah. at different lead times. So mm. it's, it's a reasonably seamless. Mm. Okay. Um, so a question here from uh, Nigel. Now, um, I think this may be specifically for you, Daniel. I'm not sure. Um, uh, so I don't know. You'll have to understand this hopefully you'll be able to understand this are the three-month outlook for contingency planners from the met office of any use to you are you familiar with these uh, outlooks i'm vaguely familiar i uh, i don't use them a huge amount but that's probably more of a reflection of me uh, i've only been in the role for about a year so i'm just slowly picking up different tools that we can use so i'll definitely check these out and see if i can bring these into my day-to-day -day jobs okay thank you yeah one thing i was interested in daniel in your talk was the you were using the um the uh sort of mirror reanalysis and i get the feeling you're kind of like subsampling that to provide some kind of um you know variability about the sort of seasonal mean kind of thing. Um, and, it, and you were sort of saying that, you know, I guess how you how you subsample that, whether you whether you sort of um, you take a sort of blocks of days or just individual days will affect the sort of correlation from day to day of the weather. Um, and, you know, whether you are able to capture long blocks or, you know, in the weather, um, I guess that would be interesting to know how you deal with that. And, and also maybe why not just look at the, the daily variability in the seasonal forecast themselves, whether that would sort of embody all of that kind of um, correlation from day to day. Yeah, I see. Uh, so we have two, two ways of sampling from that data set. The, when we're concerned about the coherence from day to day, so for example, in our 13 week ahead forecast, we we don't take chunks. We just take the whole weather for the season okay. and we just move it by day to day. So if that weather occurred on a Monday, it would have a very different demand to if it occurred on a Thursday. So we just make sure that we get all of that possible range of weather across all of our days, retaining the coherence. Uh, for the winter peak forecast, we're less worried about the sort of time series of the weather through the winter, just what the minimum peak, uh, what the maximum demand could be. And so for that, we stitch, we take 10 to 15 day chunks and looking for coherent weather patterns from each year and stitch together. Uh, Good idea. I'm looking at the daily variability in the seasonal. We'll have to start thinking about that. Yeah, yeah I guess. Uh, it's a good go. Why do you use Mara instead of Vera? Fine. 
<laughs> I wonder if that would come up. Uh, legacy is probably the, the biggest reason, but very happy to move to uh, the new new era product. Yeah. It'll yes, so we had, an interesting, uh, we had an interesting uh, presentation on the new era five reanalysis only yesterday. So yeah, that is, uh, is available. Um, yeah, I mean, I, the, the other thing I had, uh, my question the, uh, I sort of raised was this, you know, the idea that you have some kind of hard limits that you mustn't, uh, you know, you have to be able to deliver, or, you know, you can't sort of have a situation where things fall over. Does that limit the ability to use forecasts, you know, that you, if you have to cater for these uh, extremes under any sort of eventuality? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the the planning needs to look at they need to put one number into their system that, that can reflect a minimum or a maximum or or a mean or so it's if we had some idea of the uncertainty they can plan for a range of different scenarios relatively quickly the biggest constraint is when we have to deliver certain products so winter outlook has to be out well ahead of the winter and so the information we have available at that stage is just climatological weather and so we have to construct as best as we can what the winter might look like from that historic data thank you i don't know if either of you would like to to carry on discussing i don't think we've got any more questions i, I haven't seen any more questions lined up here I mean, I, personally, I think this is a fascinating subject. I know it's uh, it's quite new and stuff, but uh, it's really it's really good to see this uh, being developed, and uh, and, and hopefully, um, in the bigger meeting we have next year, we'll have a few more cases as well um, to to go alongside yours, Daniel. That'll be really interesting. But is there anything else you'd like to discuss, Alberto? There's actually, sorry, uh, Mark. Uh, I don't know if you have time, but there's a couple of more questions. I see, Min. Uh, Hazel. Uh, okay, yes, at the top here. Yes, okay. Um, okay, so, uh, so, okay, so this one here, sorry, these are just, uh, yes, they are here. Um, so this is a question, I don't know who this is for, but this is from Min. Uh, how do you deal with the risk caused by the seasonal forecast uncertainty in national grid forecast? I guess that one's for me. Um, <laughs> Sounds like it. So at the moment, uh, at the moment, we don't use any seasonal forecasts until we have a better understanding, until we develop this product a bit further and we have a better understanding of the uncertainty. We have to provide some forecast of what we think the demand will be that winter. Uh, so the way we deal with the uncertainty is to get to use our historical data to give us the best understanding of what we think the demand will be. If then there is skill in the seasonal forecast, which allows us to adapt that, that would be absolutely brilliant if we could get to that point. We know that that seasonal forecast won't be right every year, but over the long run, if we can, if we use it for 50 years and it, if there's skill there, then in the long run, we should be in a better position than just using our climatology. Okay. So you, you you can do better than just taking the worst case scenario from the seasonal uncertainty sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good to hear. Okay, um, a question from Hazel. Um, so how useful would updated forecasts through the winter period be? So you did mention Daniel, that you sort of do your analysis in September, but um, is there a chance to update things? Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. So the main purpose of the peak demand forecast is to make sure there's sufficient capacity and our margins will be protected for that winter. So that, to make sure that's the case, people need time to get the system in a position to deal with that level of demand. So that if they know about it in November, it's probably too late, but there are other internal application, uh, internal planning work and so on that we do, 
where an update of the winter peak would be useful. If we could see that there was a particular line that was thinking of going out or a particular generator, if we were able to say that our peak demand might be even higher than we anticipated, then it could potentially come into the decision making there. Any information would be useful, but it, it would have a different application to our original peak demand forecast. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. Okay, well, look, this has been great, thank you. Uh, unless you would like to say um, anything else, um, I think it's been a really nice uh, meeting and I, I've learned something and it's whet my appetite for the, uh, the bigger meeting that we're having uh, next year. So I don't know whether it's possible um, to put on to the, the, the last slide, Sharon, now. Yes, so um, so this uh, this session has been um, has been recorded, so you can see it on our YouTube site, the Royal Metsoc YouTube site, and also you can look uh, at the Royal Metsoc website itself. Um, so uh, thank you very much, um, Alberto and Daniel, for some excellent presentations there. Um, so uh, if, feel free to look there. Now, a couple of upcoming meetings we have. Um, so we have a couple in May here. So these are both virtual meetings. And the first one is on the golden age of weather radar. So looking at the use of radar in, in weather forecasting. And then uh, another one on the 12th of May, looking at the health sector and particularly health uh, and climate change. So two more interesting meetings. They're both at uh, 7 p.m. UK time. So uh, that's, that's all from us today. Um, uh, thank you very much and uh, look forward to seeing you again sometime in the future. Okay. Bye.